All right. Hello, wonderful people. Thanks for attending our panel discussion, which is titled How to Make Big Things Happen in Drupal. And uh, the reason we are here is that each of us made one or uh, not one. Each of us made several big things happen in Drupal before. So we have some stories about success and failure. And we would like to share it with you. So the first question to the panel is to introduce yourselves and to tell us why are you here. And I will start because I have the mic. <laughs> uh, so I'm Gabor Hoichi. I work for Acquia. Uh, and I'm here because um, I enjoy connecting the dots in the community and figuring out where people need help and to enable them to be their best. Uh, and that's why we organized this one, and that's why I'm also involved with organizing the Initiative Leads Keynote for Wednesday, which you should attend, even though it's in the morning, and you will probably have a lot of partying done that by that time. Uh, be there. Next one. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Herschel. I work for Agilina. Um, we are hiring, just so you know. Um, I... Did, I, I put a lot of work into the Olivero theme. I was not, of course, the only one, but I put a, a heck of a lot of work into the Olivero theme. And then um, more recently, I also put a lot of work into single directory components, which is coming out in Drupal 10.1, and I'm very excited about that. And I'm here because I want to empower other people to, to do really cool things. Hi, I'm Tiffany Barris. I'm the CEO of Palantir. And um, you know, uh, through the years, I've made a couple of different contributions. Um, DrupalCon in Chicago, I was the chair of, and been on the board for a million years. But from the code perspective, um, you know, Palantir was the driving force behind Workbench, and then more recently in the Drupal Rector initiative. And then we have another one we're working on. And we'll be talking about that probably next year. So. Hi, I'm Kristen, and I've been um, working with Drupal for almost 20 years, and uh, in contribution space maybe since around 2010. And um, more recently, so I've had a lot of contribution experience, especially with Gabor, on various initiatives, but um, in the last, about May of last year, I started a contribution events initiative uh, with the goal of trying to increase the number of contribution events, um, whether they be remote or in person, standalone or part of a camp or you know that type of thing, and um, so yeah, help spearhead some um, porting days that happened last year, uh, remote porting days um, back um, July before the Drupal 10 release, and more recently um, have been doing this uh, project adoption where we're trying to get people who know how to do maintainership to adopt modules that need a Drupal 10 version. And we're still looking for people, so I'll talk to you after this. All right, so since you have the mic anyway, All right. Uh, so what drives you to do this? What motivates you to be involved with these big things? Um, I mean, I've always liked doing Drupal contribution just because it's fun and I love all the people and all that. Um, but specifically for the things that I've been focusing on um, more recently would be that I like enabling other people to be able to contribute. So I help out with the you know, mentoring and things like that. And I think by creating more contribution events, then, then we can get more people contributing and more people helping out. So a little thing can actually become a big thing by you know, getting more and more people involved. And it just takes that first person to kind of start and go from there. Cool. Good. So I think for, you know, for us, for Palantir, we've been in the community now for um, over 17 years. And we like to, to think about these kind of gnarly, gnarly problem spaces. And part of that is my, my core love of, of you know, ducktails, right? I want to work smarter, not harder all the time. And so when we find those opportunities, we kind of go after them and say, okay, yeah, this is a space where we can we can carve out and we can really make a difference. Because I think part of being in open source is that kind of recognition that sometimes you're standing on the shoulders of others and sometimes you, you need to let them stand on your shoulders. So I get really excited when I see websites running my code, All right? So like, to me, it's, it's kind of almost ridiculously awesome that there are hundreds of thousands of websites on the internet that have 
you know, code that I wrote installed. And I, I would also like to apologize to all those websites. Um, <laughs> but but I, I, I literally get a kick out of that. And I also like making things easier for people. Like, I, I primarily work in, in Drupal's front end. And Drupal's front end hasn't had a lot of momentum, but, but it, it, recently it does. And, and I feel really excited about that. And once you have momentum, it's a lot easier to keep on going. And I love building that up. And I love that feeling of waking up in the morning and, and looking on Drupal.org and seeing that something I had been working is now a part of Drupal. And that's, that's a really big deal. Yeah, one thing that I would add is I recently reread uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a... <laughs> and, and the author makes a great point that you can't avoid problems in life. So the, so the key to happiness in life is to pick the problems where you enjoy solving them and then try to not give up about the rest of them. So uh, if we pick the right problems and then, then we um, keep solving them, that, that kind of leads to happiness. But uh, maybe it also helps if you get paid. So the question is, are you doing this in your paid time? Are you doing this as a volunteer combination? Or how does this work for you? So, um, you know, Palantir, what we do is we look at um, a triple win. I'm looking for things that are wins for our clients. I'm looking for things that are in problem spaces where the Palantir team um, would be challenged and engaged by it. And I'm looking for spaces that have a huge impact in Drupal. So um, when I do that, I, I then find those opportunities, whether it's Palantir funding it or a combination of Palantir and one or more clients. And then so I bake it into our process. So that's um, and I want to be very clear, I've never made a commit to Drupal code. Not that I can't, but my contributions are different. They're not just code, it's about the vision and seeing you know, where we can have that impact and, and organizing others around it at the Palantir. So your model is that you fund the teams that are working on these things? <laughs> That's right. I, I'm looking for opportunities where there's alignment between a, a need that we've seen and we know how to solve and what our client needs are. And so I may take that um, and, and spread it across a couple different clients. That's how Workbench happened. Uh, Rector was something that Palantir funded directly um, with our PPP funds when we were, you know, uh, when COVID first shut everything down. I was like, I now know what we're going to work on. We're going to work on Rector, and we're going to make a run at it. Good job, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so um, funding, yeah, that's, sponsorship is a, is a big thing, and not everybody has the privilege of getting funded to do contribution, and that has always been a problem. Um, in my early days, I was um, definitely just volunteer, and then um, when I was working um, at my last company, although we did, um, we did sponsor employees ourselves, um, I was working so many overtime hours, it didn't really feel like it was volunteer, right? It was just part of the business and, you know, it was a thing. So, um, but, you know, COVID happened and life changed and I was like, well, some people get uh, funded for this. That Some people are, I know people that, you know, get funded for contribution. Why can't I do that? So I uh, went on GitHub sponsors, actually got a couple of sponsors for a little bit of money and, and then I was doing some work with Salsa Digital um, for client work um, on some government projects. And I'm like, hey, maybe they'll fund me. And so I talked to the CEO, and he's like, what is this thing, funding, contribution? And we talked through it, and I convinced him that it was well worth their money to invest uh, in, in contribution. Um, so they sponsored, uh, they part-time um, did like 10, 15 hours a week um, back about a year and a half ago. But what was cool about it wasn't just that, that um, which awesome, you know, I get to pay, get paid for contribution. But after a few months, they're like, well, can you teach our team about contribution? Can you actually help us do better at contribution? They had been doing contribution, but kind of under the radar. And I'm like, yeah. So I kind of went over, and instead of just me doing it, I was actually helping the whole team do it. So that was pretty cool. Very cool. Mike? So. I, I would say, like, like my experience is I've worked for some amazing companies that, that kind of partially make space for contribution. You know, I used to work for uh, Lullabot. I worked for Vaultis, and now I'm with Agilina. And each of those companies, it's very important for me and for them to make space for contributions, which means that they're not working you the entire time. Um, that being said, 
to be honest, like a good chunk of the contribution comes on my own time too, you know, um, mainly because I'm passionate about it. And, and I recognize that that can lead to burnout. So I'm always kind of doing myself check-ins to make sure like, hey, I don't have to do this. You know, this is volunteer, but, you know, so yeah. So, so what do you do? What, what do you do about your burnout? Do you want to talk about that? Well, like, so, so there was one period in when I was creating Olivero and, and I just, I took a break, you know, I took a break for like three months or so. And, um, you know, th that was fine. I also, if I don't want to work, I don't want to work. There's nothing forcing me to do this, you know, like uh, the companies that I work for, even though they make space for contributions, the contributions are not mandatory. So... So there's nothing, there's nothing forcing me to do this. Uh, it's just that I, I happen to enjoy it. I'm lucky, you know. Okay, that's great. Uh, so I think when we talked about this, you too had stories about burnout and tor turnover as well and how you can replace yourself. So even though you kind of figure out how to make this big thing, then you can also figure out at the same time your successors or how to how to keep this alive. So do you want to talk about that? Uh, well, there have been sessions on, just on burnout. So uh, yeah, it is a big, big topic. And I've definitely had a lot of ups and downs. Um, this is my first DrupalCon in, uh, in person DrupalCon in four years. So that is a big thing. And I think actually that helps re-energize, at least for me, and I think a lot of other people of like actually seeing people in person. Um, but yeah, no, I've definitely had plenty of times where I just had to walk away and, and take that time to myself and try to decide if I wanted to invest, you know, my, especially my, if it was my free time, do I want to invest in it? And it's, um, it's hard. And I think the best thing really, um, what I found was reaching out or sometimes people will reach out to me and just, you know, check in on Slack or, or however you can and just see how people are doing. If people have disappeared, there's probably a reason. So I, I, I think in, you also in. you also built a system that uh, that when when your initiative is well documented enough that other people can take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So good reminder. So uh, so last year we did these uh, porting events, and so I did the very first one in July, and um, I had a lot of help with documentation and kind of setting up a checklist and all that, and it was really awesome. And what was really cool was I was like, okay, well, around the July one, and I was like, well, kind of tired. I don't know when I want to run the next one, because, you know, it's still some effort. Um, and then fortunately, so a, a company, some people from a company, they're like, hey, we don't do enough contribution. Can we run one of these, you know, porting events? I'm like, yes, that's exactly why I was trying to do this was so that, you know, enable other people. And so what I said, yeah, totally, I will mentor you to run the event. So they ran it and I just mentored them. I, you know, I had to have some sessions with them and um, Zoom calls and, and trying to say, here are some tools that you can use, you know, use them if, you, if they make sense, they don't have to. And then they were able to tweak it so that it worked for them. And then we incorporated some of that back into the process. So Palantir, we have, you know, we've been around in the Drupal space for a, a long time. And we've certainly had so many amazing colleagues um, and, and now Palantir alums who contributed a lot in their personal time. and. That model has never really been sustainable, particularly now as, as those of us who may have not had kids now have kids and things like that. So when, when Palantir um, wants to support doing something big, we do it as part of our work. So it's either part of the client work or it's a project where an, there's an entire team. Um, one of the things that pieces of feedback that we've heard over the years is that it, it can feel isolated or feel really lonely. And so our teams are used to working together to solve something. And that's, that's how we think about it. That's how we think about that model for them. And I think that that then becomes about what Palantir's contribution is rather than the individuals on the team. It does create some, some challenges because that's not a very familiar model in the Drupal community. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it, it gets confusing for people who are like, oh, I want to talk to this person who did this thing. And it's like, well, actually they were allocated to that. And, and they did a great job, but it's really Palantir you, you want to talk to if we need to um, to advance it or do something else. Yeah, yeah. We talked about this when we were discussing what to cover here. Is that the 
the you know, open source and Drupal especially, there's a lot of value in karma, in building karma. And there's this disconnect between is this a karma of the person or a karma of the company and how you can transfer that karma from from uh, like how you can make people understand that now you maybe have a different person that's funded to work on this. Yes. Yeah. I mean, because we, we're more involved than just funding. Like we you know, really identify what those strategic priorities are and, and move them forward and we'll rotate team members um, as they move on to different projects and things. So it's really the company that's taking responsibility for it. So it's, it's a little bit different. All right. One more thing on the, you just um, spark something. So uh, the rotation. So actually, that's something at least at Salsa that has been super helpful because um, although you know there's quite a few people that can um, do contribution, usually we'll allocate you know a chunk of hours for you know one or two people, and after a while you know they may be like you know I, I'm good for a while. I, I I would like to just you know focus on client work, and that's totally fair, right? People you know they get tired of whatever it is. And so then we rotate people in, and that's been really great, actually. Um, so don't you know discount that, especially if you're you know, a company owner, organization owner, and you have you know team members that might want to do some contribution, but maybe they don't want to do it every single week. Maybe they want to do it for a couple months and then you know swap out and then keep going. Great. Um, so when we were preparing for this, we talked about a lot of different challenges that people could face when they start a big thing in Drupal. So you have like a favorite or one that you want to highlight? Yeah, take it. Yeah, so <laughs> one of the issues w when you're trying to get, you know, attention on on a project is is knowing people, you know, and and I've I've been lucky enough and privileged enough to like have some personally rela relationships with core committers and excellent developers and things like that. Um, not everybody not everybody can do that. Um, and another thing that like really helps out is being in person. And we're all we're all p privileged and lucky enough to be here in person, but not everybody can do that. Um, when when you want to get something committed to core or build something or or get feedback, it makes it's a lot easier to do so if you have a personal relationship with the person that is the final decision maker. You know, if I can reach out to someone and say, hey, Lori, what do you think of this? And then he will say, like, Mike, that's a horrible idea. Or, or say, like, you know, you could do this if you do that. But if I did not know him, it would be, like, it would be very intimidating for me to reach out. And um, we recognize that this is a problem. This is hard to scale. And, and, and there's, there's been a lot of discussion um, one of the discussions that I'm, that I'm really interested in is, as I was talking with a, um, a fellow Drupal Association board me member, Nick Wienhoff, who works for GitLab, and they have a, they have a program where they have employed uh, merge request coaches. And so if you're a person who like, wants to, you want to contribute code to GitLab, and you want to get this into GitLab core, but you don't ha maybe have those personal relationships to make this happen, you can hit a button, and then at some point, the coach will show up in your issue queue, talk with you, and say, hey, number one, this needs tests. Number two, this is a never. But number three, the whole idea is OK. And that can be like the first line of getting your code in shape for core. And at that point, when that is ready, that person will then go to the committer and say, hey, so-and-so, you need to take a look at this, because it's pretty cool, and I've been working a lot with this person. It, something like that in Drupal, I think, would be very valuable. But at the same time, we're, we're still a little ways away from that because GitLab, of course, has paid positions. And you know, the Drupal Association, the funding is, is, is not as much as it needs to be. I think for the, the challenges that we've faced, um, you know, we're an agile company, and, and we like to work in that way. So one of the things we're always trying to do is to increase our predictability. And uh, what I do know with absolute certainty is that this community is not predictable. <laughs> so <laughs> you never know when the work that you're doing is going to be really well adopted. You never know when someone's going to come in um, with, a, with a need um, that, that needs more immediate attention than you've predicted or allowed for. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the things that's, that's challenging. Um, and as we kind of touched on in the last question, 
just the confusion it causes when it's not the person who's driving this thing, but it's actually the company that's driving that. I, we don't really have a lot of mature processes around that. We understand as a community, um, or even if you're new to the community but familiar with open source, you know to go to the maintainer, you know to go to that, but um, it's not always obvious if it's a Palantir initiative um, that really that person may no longer be working at it or may not, not even be at Palantir anymore um, and may have no interest in it whatsoever. So I think that that kind of confusion kind of comes up. So there's just, there's that that unpredictability, that that unknowns um, that, that kind of come up and make it challenging as you're thinking about um, you know, how you maintain it in after it's, you know, the, the big development release. We know what that looks like, but it's that, that the long commitment that you have, that one, that's really where the challenge comes in. So, wait, so um, do you think that there's a, so the predictability problem, I think part of it is when the owner, when there's an ownership mismatch between things. So when you're like, make this big shiny contribution to the community and you give them as a gift, then the community does not have ownership over that gift. They just get this like big blob of thing and they don't, they can't make anything out of it. So, uh, so do you have like, did you find good models for, for working on this? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a balance, right? Part of what the value that we bring and the reason that we're able to accelerate the innovation in the way that we do when we, when we make these contributions is because we do have teams that have established charters and they know how to create working agreements and they know how to work together in a really collaborative and deep way. Um, but you need to balance that and you know our control over our ways of working with working in the open. So there is a, a nuance to it. You don't, you don't get it all the way done for your own definition of done or all the allocation you intend to make to it. You take it about 80% 80, 80 of the way so that others can understand the vision and start to imagine their own use cases in it. So then that's when we start working in the open. Um, you know, there have been cases in the past where companies are like staking out ground. We're not ones to stake out ground. We want people to scratch their own itch. We get that. Um, but when we're working on something big, we, we do get about 80% of the way there. And then we start to create blogs and scaffolding so that others can join us in that, in that space because it does belong to everybody. Um, so that working in the open piece before you have run out of whatever investment you're interested in making in it is a really key piece um, for, I think, organizational level development. Yeah, well, Angie Byron had this blog post that we always refer that has perfectionist Pat and sloppy Sam and perfectionist Pat is working on their own on the side in the corner and makes everything perfect and then gifts it and then nobody cares. And then sloppy Sam is there and is very sloppy and makes crappy things, but then people join and then they are involved and it, it, it all becomes good at the end. Yeah, we, we try and hit it somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, you know, I think that there, uh, you know, and this, this may resonate with some in the room, but um, when you work with a high-functioning team, um, you really want to keep doing that in that way. <laughs> and so that, that's why we try and balance that working in the open and inviting others into that process, but also really leveraging the value that our teams um, can deliver. Great. So challenges. Yeah, um, I think, so I've been operating a lot in the sort of lead organization, mentorship, that sort of space, rather than so much of the hands-on coding. And, you know, I've done that, and I still do a bit of that, but I think, um, you know, I feel like I'm making more impact um, in this sort of organizational space. And I think one of the challenges, really, people don't like to organize, seriously. like. They don't like to organize. Like, who here is like a project manager or something? Nobody. No hands are going up? <laughs> OK, who begrudgingly has been a project manager for things? A few hands? Wow, OK. No, I'm much better, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Off so that's what I'm talking about. Like, um, so I've done all the things. I've done the coding and the organizing and the marketing and all the things, right? So when I'm, I feel like that's a place that people People will step up to write a patch or write some tests or whatever. I feel like we, we do that pretty well. Um, but yeah, the organi organizing and the like rallying the troops and trying to like lead the, you know, horses to water and ha whatever, herd cats, all that fun stuff, right? Um, we don't have enough people to do it. And actually, it's not that hard 
It isn't. It really isn't that hard. And I'll tell you a little story. So this um, contribution, um, uh, the, the project adoption thing that I kind of kicked off a few months ago, it literally is a spreadsheet, OK? It is a spreadsheet. So um, there was a, so this is part of the Drupal 10 Readiness Initiative, and it's kind of a sub-initiative that happened. And it was at some, you know, we have the bi-weekly meetings, and I'm like, well, we need to get more modules over to Drupal 10, you know, and, you know, it's just kind of stalled, and things aren't happening. And I'm like, you know, you, know, you can go through this whole process, which it sounds like that a lot of people in the room are more of the developer side, right, where um, abandoned module process, that kind of thing. Um, but no one was just doing it. So I said, okay, I'm just gonna make a spreadsheet. So I said, okay, people, you know, chime in. What, what projects would you like to get moved over? And, you know, people are chiming in. Uh, made a spreadsheet, lots of metadata, you know, all these different things. Like, when was the last commit? Um, you know, how, what's the status of the module? Blah, 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 all that stuff. And then the magic of the spreadsheet, like, people actually started volunteering because I had a column. Like, oh, yeah, okay, I can take that one. Well, Sure, I can take that one. Lucas Heading from Nicaragua, he took like, you know, 20 of them or something, <laughs> whatever. It was just like really awesome, you know? It was just like a spreadsheet, right? Like it can be really simple to organize something, um, but for some reason I think people feel kind of intimidated. I think I think it always helps when you kind of can scope the problem space. So the there's these several thousand modules that are not ported is a un, un, unthinkable problem space. But when you have this spreadsheet and okay, I can take twenty. Like okay, twenty is not bad. It's much less than a thousand. So so I think it helps when you scope the problem space. So that's also why I think initiatives. Uh, some of the initiatives work really well because their Drupal community is this big, huge community and it could be very scary for people and, and you need to know people to make stuff happen because that's that because there's just a lot of things happening and, and people prioritize uh, by, by that. And the initiatives help with having a smaller part of the community that you can belong and that has a, a tighter scope. So you can feel more of the belonging and also have the tighter scope of what it, what you are delivering and then can celebrate the success without this whatever decade-long decade effort of everything that you want to do in this area kind of thing. Yeah. Nice. So when we talked about this, uh, several of you said that there were unexpected wins of uh, going to do big things that you did not expect. So do you want to talk about that? Maybe Mike? I uh, I guess I became like I became a way better developer, you know. Um, in in it, I, I guess I guess first of all, it took longer than I expected. Like you know, when I when I started Olivero, I, I think I was even like starting in like when Drupal eight point nine was out, and I was like, you know what, maybe I can get this in by nine. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, it, it took a lot longer. It's it was more involved. I, I feel like I could I could do it a lot quicker now since I've been through the process. But because of that, actually, I became a lot like a much better developer. I've learned a whole bunch about accessibility, uh, especially from Andrew McPherson, who's one of our accessibility maintainers. And uh, I learned I learned a whole. I I ended up like doing a bunch of really cool things. And I I can tell you like, if if future me went back to pass me and said, do this. I'd be like, hell no, I'm not going to do that. That's way too difficult. <laughs> but, it, it, you know, if you do things incrementally, it happens, you know. And, and I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think just keeping momentum and having, having a good core group of people matters, you know. It's, it's like an adventure almost. Yeah, you are. So, yeah, you also got Drupal into cool front-end news sites, which was like, wow. <laughs> Articles about Drupal, cool front end stuff. Yeah. It's a new experience, um, and also like your celebrate celebratory posts that are like building up the momentum in the front end space are, I think, really powerful. It's important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I touched upon a couple of them. Um, so, you know, building some sort of framework for running s events, and then having someone just unexpectedly say, "Yeah, sure, we'll take that and run with it." Um, I mean, that was the goal, but I guess I didn't really think it was necessarily going to happen. But yeah, it was, uh, that was uh, at least so quickly. Um, so that was a pleasant surprise. And then I was surprised at how, I mean, just a 
spreadsheet could just make so much, you know, happen, really. I mean, it, it's, it seems so, you know, silly, but it isn't because it was just like an easy tool. Like if you could just make something really easy for someone, they're happy to jump in for an hour or two or whatever, right? You just kind of, you just give it that, you know, you just say, hey, you know, just pick something and, and run with it. And, and I, I, I was very pleasantly surprised at, at how well that went. And then it all comes together in a much bigger thing at the end. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the, the thing that always is a pleasant surprise to me is how quickly um, the community will adopt something, right? So Workbench was, you know, this entire suite of, of, of features. And, you know, we intended it for Contrib. So I don't, I don't think at the time that it, I really expected it would end up in core. I thought it would kind of always be a bit separate. Um, Rector's a little bit different. Um, the, I had a big vision for Rector. I was like, I see this potential. I, this is going to be really cool. And it's going to change the level of effort. It's going to shorten um, how long it takes to get, you know, our Contrib modules up to the, the latest version of Drupal. And it's going to focus how we use our effort as a community, right? So, um, you know, it just it, it just depends on on that. But even even still, even though I had this big vision, I still think Rector was really really cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 And this built a whole ecosystem of the update button, a bunch of other tools. And it's way beyond us, right? And that that's the vision, right? The the you know, go ahead and seed it through, and then it, we don't own it, but but you know, we just kind of plant that seed, and it grows into a garden that's well beyond any of us at this point. Yeah, that's the goal of all of the big things. So I have a couple of questions for the audience. Uh, so raise your hands who are currently contributing to Drupal, either the code or community events, whatever you do. Okay, it's more than half of the audience. Thank you. Uh, put your hands down. So who are you paid for doing that contribution? All right, it's like one third of the people that had their hands down before. Maybe a quarter. All right. Some wiggly hands. Yeah. Some wiggly hands as well. <laughs> so Sometimes. You're somewhat paid. All right. So now that we know that about half of our audience do not currently contribute to Drupal Core, half of our audience contributes to Drupal Core, and a third of that uh, gets somewhat paid to contribute to Drupal Core, uh, what would be... Uh, the message that you think that people should leave this room with? All right. I think uh, really the two key takeaways for me are that before you start to consider doing something big, be really clear which model you're going to pursue, right? There are four different ways of doing big things that are represented up here. And each of those models has a consequence and impacts on you know how you're going to assemble your team. Right. I don't have to worry about recruiting people to the team initially for that big lift because I'm going to commit to it internally. Um, but if you are going to do it, an initiative like Olivero and you don't want to spend all of your free time doing it because you don't get the exact same dopamine hit that Mike does, um, you know, or you have a family, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he requires your time and attention too, um, you know, then then you need to recruit other people. And so, as Gabor said, Mike did a really fantastic job of of the kind of communication around it. And that's one of the things you have to do. Kristen's done an amazing job of the organization around it. So be really clear on what kind of contribution model you have. And then you can use that to tailor, as, as Gabor said before, the, the scope of what is achievable. Um, so when you kind of narrow that back in, it helps you to be agile. It helps you identify what is a realistic, minimum valuable product that you can actually put out um, and so that you don't experience the burnout, hopefully, and, and you can uh, really help Drupal innovate faster. It's important that you can also celebrate success, that you have the, the achievable goal, yeah. Yeah, um, I think Dries said it today was the power of one. So definitely, you know, if you have a team, awesome. But you can do something amazing just by deciding to do it, right? Um, so the contribution events initiative, when I was kicking around the idea last May, I'm like, I wasn't going to in-person events. I wanted more remote contribution events because I wanted them and I wanted it to happen and I wanted to see it. And I was kind of scratching my own itch. And I kind of ran it by Gabor. I'm like, Can I, should I do this? He's like, why not? So I said, okay, why not? Then I'm gonna start doing this. So, you know, there is a power in one. And then 
you get more people, right? That one becomes two, becomes ten, you know, and, and then we start, you know, impacting everybody. So I think, um, you know, it's, and, it, and maybe it won't work out, and that's okay, right? Maybe it won't work out, you know, so we, we've had, you know, it's like had some ups and downs, and, um, you know, we have people that have come, come and gone in, in these initiatives and such, but I think, yeah, just be okay with, with just doing it trying it and you know if you need help rally the troops uh, ping us ping other people in the community and people are really supportive so you know just go for it so I have so many things to say <laughs> <laughs> so like one of the most important parts at least for me is like assembling a team you know so it's like people have their different superpowers and and I, I can tell you like when I was doing Olivero um, uh, Matthew Tift who was in this room just a little bit ago he, he did nothing but run the meetings. And I, w I would talk to him and I would say, thank you for doing this. He's like, oh, I'm not doing anything. And, and, and I would say like, no, you are taking like a lot off my plate. I don't have to worry about this now because you just get it done. You know, if you can help out some with, with that, it's a big deal. And then in addition to that, I would have like other people help me do this and this. Um, and it was awesome. Uh, along that lines, I would also trade people issues. I would say, like, if someone can uh, review and maybe RTBC this issue, I will totally do the same to yours, <laughs> you know? I, I would also bribe people with beers. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, bike shedding. Um, bike shedding can be positive, but uh, let me define what bike shedding is. Bike shedding is when you go off on, like, random tangents. So bike shedding can be positive, but you need to time box it. You need to say like, all right, we're going to deal with this. We're going to talk about this for a certain amount of time. But then you need someone with authority to put a stake in the ground and say like, all right, well, this is it. We discussed that. Anything else beyond this can be tackled, but in a follow-up issue. Follow-up issues are like a magical way to say like, yeah, we're going to we got to get this done because perfect is the enemy of good. If you're looking for perfection, we are all very opinionated people and we're not going to make everybody perfectly happy. And we have to realize that. Um, as you said earlier, like momentum and momentum matters, you know, hyping matters. Like uh, I work with Mateo right here on single directory components. Mateo did all the coding and, and, and I, I, I kind one of the things that I would, I would help out with is, is writing blogs and posting. And so I was talking about Mateo and Mateo was like, no, this is not going to make it for 10.1. And I'm like, it's going to make it in 10.1 because I'm going to blog about it, get people really excited about it, and that's going to put pressure on the core committers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I told them this. And I did, it worked. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, I did that, like, totally intentionally, you know? And, and but, like, building momentum and hyping, like, like that matters, you know, and, and, and celebrating success matters. You know, we need to say like, we're doing some really cool, innovative stuff here. Like, let's talk about it. Let's, let's write about it. Let's celebrate it, you know, and, and, and yeah. Ta-da. Yeah. So all of us have been involved with a lot of different successful things through the years. Uh, so you can find us after your session as well to talk. But if you have any questions now, we would be very happy to answer them. Or comments. Or, or like rotten tomatoes. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, I will repeat. Your first contribution? What was your first contribution? Oh, I went. You start. Uh, yeah, so uh, like I had literally been using Drupal since like around 2008. My first ever like minorish contribution was at DrupalCon Bogota at a code sprint, and I made like the most minor CSS change in Bartik. And beyond that, I really didn't even do any type of major contribution until I until I started doing Olivero. So I I probably went like 10 years in Drupal without doing anything major, for whatever reason. Uh, yeah, ugh, you're testing memory. Um, I would say probably the first contribution, I would, I mean, I call speaking a contribution. Um, so yeah. I would say speaking at probably at like DrupalCon um, San Francisco, maybe 2010, something like that. But um, but after that, I, I'd say, I don't, maybe it wasn't the first, but a, a major one is we did the Drupal 8 uh, multilingual initiative, which was super awesome. We did, yeah. That was that was that kind of got me hooked. I mean, I did stuff before that, but that definitely kind of got me hooked. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's been a long ride. 
So I, um, if you look me up on Drupal.org, you'll see I don't have any code commits. Um, that, that doesn't mean I don't contribute. And uh, I think the first big thing that I took on was in 2008, I think, um, I led the search for a Drupal.org rebrand and hired Mark, Mark Bolton to do that work. Um, and then I was uh, elected to the board first in 2009, and I served for nine years. And then I'm in the middle of my next go round on the board, so I've been serving three more years. So other than Dries, I'm the longest serving um, board member. So those are probably the first two things that people would know me for. Then DrupalCon Chicago in 2011. Yeah, I wanted to mention that. It was an amazing conference. I still have the pajamas. <laughs> they were great. So it was a field museum party. Yeah. Yes. Um, Mark, you talked about uh, hiring people, but is it easier to do because you have that personal connection with the people who are working on the board? Um, one of the things I realized when I was starting out with uh, contributing to Drupal is that a lot of the people are a lot more approachable than people think. Yes. Yeah, it's a lot easier to just ping people and ask for feedback or, or get guidance from the or committers in the work you are doing. Uh, it, I think that's something people don't realize, and they think, oh, it's like this, this man in the, in the ivory tower yes. doing core things, but they're normal people, and they're people who love the community, and we'd love to help people get better and uh, join us, really. Yeah. I think yeah. that's something important. Definitely. Yeah. So what Bjorn is saying for the recording, so is that uh, uh, so? What Mike said is that we need this personal connection, but what most people don't realize is that the people that you try to approach to make that personal connection are really friendly people. And I would add one more thing: is that they need your help <laughs> because they have these big visions of things that they want to achieve, and they need more people to achieve those big visions. So they need you to contact them. They're not just friendly, but they need you. Uh, so one thing that I, I, I will let you answer as well but, or comment, but one thing that I like about the redesign of this conference is that they put the initiative lead keynote on Wednesday morning. So their people leading the initiatives will be on stage in person, talk about their things. Matteo will be there, talk about single directory components. And then after the keynote, after they talked on stage about their initiatives, they will lead contribution in person in the room in the contribution room so you can like listen first on like what are they working on what are their goals what you can be involved with and then right after sit with them in person and be involved right there um, so i think that's really a good way to to channel people right away into making these connections so uh, i know there's a lot of opportunities in town to like sightsee but hopefully you'll be here on wednesday as well I would like to second everything Gebber said. <laughs> uh, just one, yeah, follow up with, um, I think one thing that makes it much easier is getting involved in a particular initiative. If, you, if you're just like, I don't know what to do, then um, that is the easiest way to get involved because it's already organized. So you, you have that kind of baked in and then you can just kind of see, well, what do you need? What help do you need? And you can find your, you know, your way around like, oh, oh, I like this, I don't like that. And that is just definitely, that's been my go-to. I mean, I've done contributed modules and stuff like that, but my favorite thing is working on initiatives. You know, I, I think as you consider that, that there are some uh, resources which are scarce, right? The, the amount of time core committers have, um, they have to prioritize, right? And we use our karma system, both the, the you know explicit and an implicit one. But um, it, you know, Mike's talked about the richness of in-person, face-to-face communication, and that's obviously going to be your your fastest path to a relationship and establishing that you're you're you know aligned with someone or that this is what's going to move forward. But not everybody can meet face-to-face, -face, um, so consider that you know when you're working on an initiative, as Kristen said there can be video chats, right? That's also a rich version of communication. You know, what do you do in Slack? What do you do in the issue queue? Be mindful of how you're showing up in the community spaces because that helps people who may not have met you to know that, you know, you are a trustworthy person and, and make them more likely to put you at the top of the priority queue, um, you know, when it's your turn, right? Because they trust that you're gonna take that and turn it into something that's for the benefit of all. So, um, you know, if you can meet people in person, that's great, but don't be discouraged if that's not available to you in that moment. 
um, just think about what is the richest you know, form of communication I can use um, to really support this and move it forward. I have one more thing to say that's like completely unrelated to, <laughs> to that. When I, was, when I was doing Olivero, something that, uh, l like a, a tactic that, that we kind of fell into that, that worked really well is I, w I would set, like, I, I would set up meetings every two or three weeks with a core committer, you know? So I, w I, would, I would be talking to Lowry and I would say, hey, uh, when can you meet in two to three weeks? And he would say, all right, well, let's meet on Tuesday, you know, 8 a.m., your time. And so leading up to that, it's almost like a deadline. I would have a number of issues that needed to be discussed. I would have a number of issues that were RTBC. And I, I had him for two hours to like look through these issues <laughs> and he would either commit them or, or set, them back, uh, send them back to me. And that dramatically increased the pace of us getting in. You know, it was it was yeah. a big deal. I mean, I mean, one of the things you're very good at, Mike, is being able to ask for help and and not wasting an, a second of the help that you get. Do you know what I mean? Like you're so intentional and you're so grateful, and you show so much respect and gratitude for the people that you work with. It really makes people want to continue to work with you. Thank you. Yeah, we recently had a core committer on site in London, and one of the things that came up several times was the lullabot nudge. So I'm gonna say hi to all the lullabots here because there, there's now apparently like it's a it's a thing that the lullabot nudge is like this very gentle thing that like hey this is here it would be great to if you could review it so uh so it's important how you appear there and how you get involved but it's also important to keep in mind that all of us are approachable and we are here and we need you to approach us and to be involved because that's how we make uh, great things happen um so maybe we have time for one more Question? Yes. So I, I was thinking about some of the stuff that you've been saying and other things that I have observed. So I, I think that getting a team together is critical, right? And some companies have the ability to sponsor and let the people to speak. And I guess my question is more for business. What would it take for company owners to organize, right, personal things, to see, well, these are the features that we feel are important, and we are sponsoring some people, and this other company is sponsoring some other people. Let's work together as a team on these features. Yeah, let me repeat that for the recording. So. Uh, so Matthew said that we talked about funding teams and funding teams within a company and working with volunteers. And what about the size of projects where several companies would have funds, but none of them have enough and they want to work together? And how, what, would, what would it take to coordinate these funds and these efforts? I think it would take the same thing that we need for a successful internal project team, which is you need to be very clear about what investment you're willing to make and upfront about what that looks like in the working agreement between the two companies, right? Because it, when a company goes to make an investment, you probably have time boxed it, you've identified what your budget is and, and what, your, what expected outcomes you have. So in Palantir's case, we're expected to deliver outcomes for our clients. That's one of the ways that we fund a lot of this stuff. And part of that introduces challenges when you're working with another company that may be working on a different you know, different time scale, or even the community who may not be working on that same time scale. As in any kind of uh, collaboration, it's about that the strength of communication and expectation management um, and, you know, understanding what, what happens there. I, I am excited to see, you know, some of what we're starting here with Pitchburg, which is, you know, Palantir was one of the, the folks who contributed. I'm happy to contribute for other people, like money, so that other people can take something forward that we would benefit from. Um, we, we're happy to fund that. Um, and that's just the way that I think about, you know, what we can reasonably do and how we can have an impact. Sometimes it's going to be money. Sometimes it's going to be pushing a team forward. Sometimes it might be, um, you know, sponsoring an individual um, or, or submitting money through the Drupal Association. So we have a, we have a bunch of different tools in our toolkit. And for things that we choose to take on and, and dedicate team member time to, it's usually something that we can get 80% of the way there, like on our own, um, just because that it requires such an intense investment at that point. And I don't want to 
I don't want to uh, miss the deadlines, essentially. But um, I'm I'm curious for how Pittsburgh might evolve. I'm I really am excited about this, um, uh, you know, about this uh, experiment, and I'm I'm really wondering what we're going to learn from it um, because I do think that could be a model, and we might start to see, like as Dries talked about today, there's a couple of those that got funded. They probably need to work together. So that's going to mean it's kind of the unexpected piece of that experiment that comes back. Yeah. yeah. The project management it goes back to that project manager. You need a really strong project manager. And if it's two separate teams, yeah, uh, that, that can be challenging. I mean, it's, it's no different than two web agencies, um, you know, that actually maybe do a project together for a government project or something. I mean, this is not uncommon, right? And yeah, the project management is key. And also just role crafting and the chartering for how it's set up, who's going to be responsible, how decisions are going to be made. Yeah. Those are all really critical conversations to have up front. Yeah, the one thing that I think will probably be a, a part of a topic of a future Dries note, I think, I think because I, I see that trend coming up, but we'll see how that goes, is that we are trying, especially in the UX area, we are trying to not focus on huge initiatives because we... We failed with one of them, and we are not really succeeding with another one. So we are what we are trying now, and what we've been very very successful with is to have smaller goals that we can achieve. And so Christina is trying to uh, a little about is now trying to work on coordinating multiple different things that people want to work on in the UX area. And instead of like having this huge goal that will probably take five years to do is to assemble different uh, people from different companies to work on these things and to try to figure out how it's going to happen. And that could be, and, and we've been struggling with not trying to name it because it's not like a big initiative, but at the same time, it's a lot of things that will altogether result in a big thing. So that's an interesting new model that we are trying at various areas. And I think that we'll see how that works out. And everything old is new again. Yeah. Because that's, uh, that's one of the ways we did a lot of image management stuff in the Drupal 7 cycle. I know Palantir worked with a couple other companies. We broke it down and said, we're gonna, we're, we'll are gonna we take this piece on, you take this piece on. You start with a coordination summit, you know, just like you would do at a DrupalCon. So uh, you can do it, but it, it you just have to have a lot of trust and a lot of good communication. Yeah. All right. So I think that's it for our time. We're already two minutes over, so... We should let you go to the welcome reception. Thank you for coming. Thanks.